What's up guys, Nike here. Welcome back to my History of the Meta series where I talk about the changes in the PvE meta through the years, both to explain to new players how we arrived where we did, as well as to hit some nostalgia buttons for some of the longtime players. In the first video, I discussed the dungeon meta from the launch until present day, and today I'm going to be talking about raids, specifically the meta that occurred from the first beta weekend until the launch of Wing 2. The raid meta began officially during the beta weekend when players got their first experience with the first raid boss of the Spirit Veil, vale, the Veil vale Guardian. It was a fairly painful event as technical issues with squad formation prevented most groups from getting a chance to even try the raid. That said, a few guilds did manage to down the boss, uh, Sickus Guild NA and Legion of Doom if I recall correctly, and the builds they used established the baseline meta that most groups would start with for the first raid wing. The Veil vale Guardian fight requires condition damage classes, and required a good amount of CC for Seeker control. At the time, in the beta weekend, the Seekers could actually be blinded. The obvious choice was to bring three Engineers, since at the time, Engineer was also considered to be the highest DPS class in the game. Uh, teams used two standard Power PS Warriors, and most teams brought a single Healer Druid and a single Chronomancer. The main bulk of Power DPS was, ironically, provided by Revenants. At this point, most teams didn't have perma quickness, so a Glint Shiro Rev brought quite a bit of DPS. Remember, this was before the Savage nerf to Revenant DPS. Also, most teams only brought a single healer, and Druid gameplay wasn't nearly as good as it is today, and it was essential for players to bring builds that were considered to be survivable, so heavy classes were often preferred. The concept of a Chrono Tank hadn't come into vogue until much later, so most teams were using a Condi Engineer, Scrapper, or a Rabid Necro, or a Hammer Guardian for their tanking. I think the biggest thing that shocks players today looking back at, at those times is that Elementalist was not considered to be a viable raid class. People took a lot more damage then in the raids, and healing was much worse. So the glassy nature of Elementalist was incredibly pronounced. It almost defies belief of current players now, but there were many QQ posts on Reddit and the official forums about how Elementalist needed to be buffed because it was a trash tier class in raids. Which is crazy if you think about it. When groups got to Gorsival, most of them initially brought the same builds they used for Veil Guardian, only to find out that the fight was quite a big DPS check compared to the Veil Guardian. Teams had no conception of skipping the updrafts, and they wouldn't have had the DPS to do it even if they did think of it. So even with quote-unquote good DPS, they ended up killing the boss around the Enrage timer or in Enrage. Many groups kept at least one or two engineers in the group, and one or two revenants, but for the most part, this is the boss where people had to start bringing elementalists. Simply because Staff Ellie was the one build that had enough DPS to help kill the boss before the Enrage timer, and because Staff Elementalist could efficiently clear the orbs. Ellie was still considered squishy and a bit of a liability, but many people began using the pre-nerf uh, power of Wash Away the Pain and Rebound to cover for it. Curiously, many Ellie players used Flame Legion runes at the time because Scholar runes were considered to be impossible to maintain for Ellie's in raids. At Sabatha, most teams reverted to dropping the Ellie's again in favor of more Revenants and Engineers. Sabatha, especially the last 25%, was considered to be a very high pressure fight with a lot of difficult to avoid damage, so squishy builds were not really considered viable. Most teams stacked Revenants again for DPS, and many also brought Hammer Guardians to give perma protection along with Semble Heals. So the initial starting point uh, in Wing 1 was the NG Rev meta, if you want to call it that. This state of affairs did not last too long, uh, however. The first crack in the armor uh, was when my guild showed the community the power of the Condi Berserker build with the pre-nerf Scorched Earth. While initially considered only relevant at Gorsival to the due to the big hitbox, it soon proved to be pretty capable at all the bosses, and began to replace Engineers as the preferred Condi DPS class everywhere. The next crack was people becoming increasingly comfortable playing Druid in raids, and comfortable with the fights in general. What did this mean? 
It meant that his player skill improved, players could play squishier classes and get away with it. It meant that you could begin to bring Ellie's or Thief for power DPS at all three bosses. This enabled Ellie to begin edging out Revenant as the preferred DPS class, especially since at the time, Alacrity was twice as good as it is now, so a class like Ellie that benefited significantly from Alacrity was more and more desirable. As teams became more accustomed to the fights, uh, reliance on Hammer Guardians declined, and Revenant remained, in most groups, as a higher DPS one of, uh, in order to pulse Fury, uh, and sometimes protection, with the Ellie taking over as the main DPS along with, uh, sometimes Condi Berserker. Hammer Guardian became even less required once people began using the second Druid in raid groups. The overwhelming power of Grace of the Land, Spotter, and Spirits eventually proved to be so good that bringing two Druids was better than bringing one Druid and another DPS class. At the time, your sub-squads were not locked when combat began, and you could move from group to group. This created a situation where one Chrono could easily keep, keep quickness up on ten people by hopping from group to group with each cast of Signet of Inspiration. This was sort of the beginning of the 442 meta comp. It was around this time that the idea of a chrono being your tank was also created. The role compression it provided was incredible, since you were going to bring a tank anyway, and you were also going to bring a low DPS chrono anyway, so combining the two into one package allowed you to fit an extra DPS player into your raid. The chrono tank has since then become the undisputed best tanking build in Guild Wars 2, and will certainly remain so, at least until the next expansion pack. Soon after, however, Alacrity was nerfed, along with the Condi Berserker, which ended Warrior as a DPS class, and killed any group uh, using the 5-5 Mirror Comp instead of 4-4-2. Additionally, the sub-squads were locked, and a Chrono could no longer move around. This resulted in people learning to brute force quickness with a single Chrono using Signet of Inspiration. The community then discovered the power, uh, incidentally, of death magic necros in fights with adds, uh, combining the healing power of the second druid to keep the minions alive. And for the first time, Necromancer became a part of the proper PvE meta. As a fight would go on, each add that died would produce a minion that the druid would sustain. Additionally, the necro would burst summon eight min minions with lich form. By the end of a fight a, with a lot of adds like Sabatha, Necros would have an incredibly high DPS. Though due to the long ramp up time, this was considered to be a bit of a gimmick build, although at least viable enough that people didn't mind having a Necro in their group. Necro would still have better days to come, which we will discuss in the next video. The great debate at this time was the 442 squad comp versus 721. For those uninitiated into Guild Wars 2 jargon, 721 means your raid squad has a 7-man sub-squad, a 2-man sub-squad, and a 1-man sub-squad, all separate from each other. The 721 configuration brought more DPS classes to the table, but 442 had better buff distribution uh, and coverage. In a 442, the main two groups of 8 got full buffs, and then the two... Uh, the, the Revenant and the Chrono received high buff uptime from the Overflow. The 721 squad had buffs, had all the buffs on the 7, and on the 2 and the 1, the buffs were either incomplete or non-existent. 442 was proven to be the superior squad composition for organized teams, as the greater buff uptime was able, able to be leveraged by better, by more experienced players who could be counted on to use the buffs to get good DPS from only having four true DPS classes. 721, however, remained viable as a pug formation, since the one in the group was often a pure healer that organized groups usually didn't bring, but could carry a pug group. The concept of a pure healer Ellie in the one is very powerful in terms of healing capability, and since the build was low DPS, the lack of receiving DPS buffs didn't change its value. By the end of Wing 1's lifespan uh, as the only raid wing, the 442 composition gained supremacy, with two power PS warriors, two druids, and four DPS that were a combination of mostly Ellie's with Necro or NG 
to a lesser extent, sprinkled in. Thief remained viable, but was considered by most to be worse than Ellie in pretty much every situation, as they had equal DPS, but the Ellie brought skills like Rebound and Wash Away the Pain, which were at the time considered to be far better than the Thief who possessed DPS and little else. And with that, I'm going to end this video uh, looking back at the evolution of the raid meta from launch of raids until Wing 2. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below.